If you will turn with me on your phones or turn with me in your Bible. I hope you have your Bible. I know we got people using their phones and their tablets. You'll turn with me to Psalm 88. I'm going to do something a little different this, uh, this morning. Um, we're going to start with a prayer, and then I'm going to just kind of talk from my heart. And then next week we will start how to deal with toxic people uh, as we enter in these last days. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we start today. Father, I just thank you so much for our church family. I thank you that we can laugh and cut up. I thank you that we, when we mess up, we're not stoned, but we walk in your mercy and your grace. And Father, I pray for those that are here, as well as those at home watching, that are struggling with dark things, hard times. They're carrying secret weights. I just pray that uh, you would encourage us and that you would remind us of some great truths that we often forget. I pray we leave out here encouraged today, Father. Encouraged in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, this week has been a week of weeping. And what I mean by that is in Romans twelve fifteen it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, sharing others' joys, and weep with those who weep, sharing others' grief. And... This week I meet with a lot of people. Um, I met with some of y'all this week. And uh, I'm trying to balance my life a little bit because I was, I was keeping that diary. So some days I was doing that like 15 hours a day. And most of the stuff I'm dealing with is bad stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm cutting back a little bit. That doesn't mean I don't like you. It just means I'm trying to balance a little bit. And uh, But this week I met with a bunch of people, and I was able to share the gospel with, with three people this week. And, um, but some of them are just in a bad spot. And I'm noticing that when Christians get in a bad spot, they feel alienated by other Christians. And what I mean by a bad spot is just in a really dark place. Um, when I was growing up, with those kids that I had, I say growing up, I was in my, gosh, with 30s and 40s, that long ago. Um, we listened to all kinds of music with our foster kids. They actually introduced me to a bigger world of music. I was listening to Contemporary Christian, and that was about it. And uh, they introduced me to all kinds. And so we listen to everything now. But one of our favorites was Toby Mac. You remember Toby Mac? All right, now listen, I knew Toby Mac back in the 80s when they had just started a rap group called DC Talks. And I was coming out, I had just given my life to Christ. I was coming off of Run DMC and Kumo D and all that. And there wasn't a lot of Christian rap out. And what they called Christian rap, I was like, I don't know what this is, but this ain't rap. And Toby Mac was part of that group. And we met him. And he was young Liberty student. He was a little cocky and arrogant. I didn't like him. And uh, then he kind of broke off solo. He got older. He got more humble. And he had a son named Truett. And on every album, Truett would do a little song or a little expo. And he did it from the time he was able to talk all the way up. And a couple years ago, Truett was going to start on his own. He uh, had been doing some demos. He'd done, he was getting ready. He was doing his first concert. And he nailed it. He nailed it, and we were all looking with anticipation. We wanted to know how he did, and we were looking it up on social media. And this little kid is now this young man, and he just nailed the kind of his dad so proud. His dad left on his tour bus and went one way, and they went to have the after celebration, and the next morning he was dead. And when we heard that, we were like, what? No, not true it. And then, like all of us do, well, what did he die from? And they weren't releasing, so people were speculating. And it came out much later, he, he died from an overdose. They don't know really all that happened. They don't know if it was the first time he tried it. They think that's what it was. They don't know. It could have been a secret thing he was struggling with. And Toby Mac said, he was always my wild child. Uh, he was a Christian. 
I loved the Lord, his parents, both his parents. And, and then what happened was when that came out, everybody was giving advice, and Toby Mac had a really, really, really hard time with that. One of the guys that I met with this week was dealing with some really bad stuff, and he was asking a question. I said, I think I can explain it to you. And, and he said something pretty profound. He said, I hope it's not one of those Christian cliches. I said, no, I hate those. I said, I hate those Christian cliches. And I started explaining and teaching. But you know, when you're in a dark spot like that, not a lot of words really help. You kind of have to work through it. Um, we're going to see if we can do this. Can we play this video? Um, Toby Mac and his wife spent some time away and just kind of isolated and then he started touring and some people said well that was messed up and he said he did that not because he wanted the attention but it was it was therapy for him and he even wrote a song called 21 years for his son that he kind of worked out his grief and I don't know if John can pull it up you gotta gotta kind of take it up from that screen and put it up on this one <laughs> If he can't get it, I will just tell the story. I didn't get up there this morning. So. We had it all in the presenter. Some cable came out of something. Else. You want to play it just off the desktop and and just put it on that screen? That's all right. Don't worry about it. I can just tell him. I'll just tell him. It'd be better that way. We'll probably save some time. I'll put it online. I'll put the video online, so if you want to watch it, you can watch it on Facebook or YouTube. But, but what he struggled with was, um, you know, God, why? And then he and his wife both went through it differently. He kind of tried to see the silver lining and what God's purposes in that was. His wife became kind of angry and got mad at God. Everybody grieves different. And, you know, I thought about the guys that I talked to this week and the ladies that are struggling this week that I talked to. And I thought about Toby Mack this week. I thought about Rick Warren. Rick Warren had given birth. Him and his wife had a son, and they loved that boy very much. From, but from a very young age, he struggled with depression. I don't know if it was chemically related or what it was, but he struggled his whole life. And they prayed for years and years and years and years. His son's a Christian, and they prayed and prayed and prayed that, God, would you just heal me? And God never healed him. And he told his dad one day, he said, Dad, I'm not going to be healed, am I? He said, well, we're going to keep praying for the miracle. We're just going to keep praying for the miracle. And, you know, and if God doesn't answer that prayer, then we'll figure out how God's going to help us navigate through it. And the last time he heard from his son, his son said, Dad, I'm just tired. And his son took his life. And... Some of y'all know what I'm talking about because y'all are like in those dark places. Not all of you. If you Listen, if you're not there, you need to thank God you've never been there. It's a bad place to be there. But there's a lot of people you're sitting with in this sanctuary. They're there. And they don't share anything because, one, they feel like nobody really understands anyway. And, two, we don't want you to think, hey, you know, I'm a weak person or whatever. So they keep it silent. But I want y'all to know that what you're feeling is in your Bible. It's in your Bible. I'm going to read this to you. This is Psalm 88. It's from the Amplified Translation. And this is one of a few prayers in our Bible that doesn't end on a happy note. Let's read it. O Lord, the God of my salvation, he knows God, he's related to God. I have cried out for help by day and in the night before you, let my prayer come before you and enter into your presence. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near the grave, Sheol, the place of the dead. I am counted among those who go down to the pit or the grave. I am like a man who has no strength, as a mere shadow, cast away from the living and abandoned among the dead, like the slain one, who lie in a nameless grave. What he's saying is, I have no one. Whom you no longer remember. Now, that's kind of harsh, but I want you to see how he's praying to God. He said that to God. Whom you no longer remember. 
and you have and and they are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the lowest pit, in dark places, in the depths. Your wrath has rested heavily upon me, and you have afflicted me in your waves. Selah. And that's a way of saying meditate on this for a minute. Think about that. Verse 8. You have put my friends far from me, and you have made me an object of loathing to them, and I am shut up, and I cannot go out. My eyes grow dim with sorrow, O Lord. I have called on you every day, and I have spread out my hands to you in prayer. Will you perform wonders for the dead? Shall, you, shall the departed spirit arise and praise you? Selah, that means think about it. Your loving kindness be declared in the grave, or your faithfulness in abandon, or the underworld. Will your wonders be known in darkness and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness where the dead forget and are forgotten? But I have cried out to you, O Lord, for help. And in the morning my prayer will come up to you. Now listen, he's not giving up. He's still praying, but he's being really honest with God. Verse 14, O Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? I was afflicted and close to death from my youth on. I suffer your terrors. I am overcome. Your fierce wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. They have surrounded me like a flood water, like floodwaters all day long. They have completely encompassed me. Lover and friend, you have placed far from me, and my familiar friends are in darkness. Some translations say this. And my friend is darkness. That's somebody that's in a dark place. Would you agree? Now listen, if this person had come to some Christians, not all, but if they'd come to some Christians, this is what some Christians would do. And it's okay. We know why you do it, but it doesn't help. Oh, just praise God. That's the problem. You're focused on yourself. Praise God. I don't know why you don't have the joy. And people that are in this place want to punch those people in the throat. You don't know what we're going through. You have no clue. The worst prayer I ever received from a Christian. The worst one. I was having the darkest day of my life. It was a hand for you. Darkest day of my life. I got vulnerable for a second. I shared with them. And so they prayed. Lord, I've never suffered. I don't know what it's like to suffer. I just cut it off. Don't know why my brother... You know what he was saying technically, what I heard... I don't know why Larry's in the fix he's in, but I'm glad I'm not in mine. And he prayed, and it fell flat with me. I'm not saying his prayer wasn't genuine. I'm not saying he wasn't faithful in his prayer. I'm saying he could not relate to where I was. Couldn't relate. This psalmist writes to God, and he knows God. He's a believer in God, and he's dealing with his outer darkness, all the circumstances from the outside. And it's creating an inner darkness. And he's exaggerating some, let's be honest. When he says, from my youth, this has been going on. You're, you've swept over me. You're... Listen, some of that's exaggeration. But when you're in dark places, that's what it feels like. And it feels like you're crying out to God and he doesn't hear you. And what he's really saying and what this psalm is saying, I want all of us to hear it, is you can be a believer in God and be in a dark place. Sometimes for a long time. You can struggle. Times it doesn't lift. Now, many Christians will teach this. That's not so. If you're a Christian, bad things won't happen. If you live, um, if you live a perfect life, these things won't happen. But that's what the religious people believed back in their day. And Jesus criticized them for that. There's a, there's a place where him and his disciples are walking, and there's a man, and he's he is severely, severely handicapped and crippled, if you will. And the disciples' response to that man's plight was this. Uh, Jesus, was it his sins or his father's parents' sins that did this to him? And Jesus blew their mind. He said, neither. We live in a fallen, broken world. Our nation's broken, our leaders are broken, our economy is broken, but we're broken. Our minds are broken. Our hearts are broken. We are selfish. 
We don't think we are. We think everybody else is. But the truth is, we are. We're all broken. And that brokenness produces suffering. Now, simple choices and behavior, and unre- that can cause suffering too, but that's not what's going on with this guy. And listen, if that is true, that if you live a perfect, sinless life, and you love God and you're faithful, you won't suffer, Jesus got robbed. He was slandered. His reputation was maligned. He was betrayed. They sought to kill him over and over. They tried to trap him with his words. His disciples didn't understand him. He was betrayed by one of his friends with a kiss. He had a false trial. He was crucified. And even on the cross, he was able to go, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If we have a false expectation that if I'm a good person and I'm this and I'm that, then I'll be blessed, you're lying to yourself. Because we live in a fallen, broken what? World. We do. And the Bible's very clear. All men have what? Sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Any man who says he has no sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. And God doesn't say that to condemn us. He's saying that to let you know you've got a problem, but we all have that what? Problem. And so when Toby Mack lost his son, he had an interview, and the interviewer asked him this, how do you get through that? And what he said was profound. I can't answer that. I don't know how you get through that. That's what Toby Mack said. Listen, praise him. He's being what? Honest and real. He said, I don't know. He said, you know, music helped me a lot. Um... And this is what he prayed to God. He said, God, I'm going to try to get through this, and I'm going to give you a chance. Listen, he's hurting. But Toby Mac didn't leave God. He was angry at God. He said, God, a relationship with God. He was honest with God. And the first thing we need to do if you're in a dark place, and I'm being serious on this church, the first thing you need to do is to be honest with the Lord. Listen, this, the psalmist that wrote this is not respectful. He is not responding right to his situation. He's voicing despair. And he's, re, he's seeing everything through a filter of pain. He's got God on cross-examination. He's not doing it right. But you know what's incredible? God put it in his Bible. Most of the psalms, when you read it, It talks about being in a dark place, and then it ends with, but you showed up, and everything got better. Or, then I remembered, and everything got better. Or, I remembered your promise, and everything got better. But there's two Psalms that doesn't happen, and this is one of them. The other one, I think, is Psalm 39. And what God's saying in this, which I think is great, I'm going to read this to you, this is a quote. The very presence of these prayers in Scripture is a witness to God's understanding that God knows how men speak when they are desperate. And he put these prayers in his word. He doesn't say this, an example of a prayer not to be prayed. He doesn't say this is a horrible thing. He doesn't say what a sinful man. Matter of fact, the person that wrote this psalm has written a lot of the other psalms. He's faithful, but there's this point in his life where he's in a dark place. And God's trying to say, I'm your God, not because you do everything right. I'm your God because I'm full of grace and mercy, and I know what you're feeling. I know how I made you. I know your frame. I catch every one of your tears in a bottle. And that's God's way of saying, I'm very aware of every hurt you're struggling with. I know when you get in the car and you just drive around and smoke a cigarette and listen to music, I know why you're doing that. I know why you go to the gym and punch the punching bag for hours. I know why you're so angry. I know why you sit on the back porch with those three beers every night. You're in a dark place. I know where you're at. When, when I was growing up, there was times my dad would make me do things I didn't want to do. But there was sometimes he would make me face a fear. And, and I hated that. He would, he would say, son, now this is just going to have to do it. You're just going to have to do it. 
and I didn't want to, and I'd beg him not to, and he didn't take me out of the bad situation, he didn't take me out of the fear, and he didn't take me out of the anxiety and stress. And the whole time he was with me, how close was he with me when we were doing those things? He was right there. And what he was trying to do in that moment was help me to, to do something. That's the second point. He was trying to work something out of me and work something into me. Parents, I'm going to bust some chops this morning. Some of the worst things we do is bubble our children. Are you being triggered by that word? We are not preparing them for a fallen, broken world. We are preparing for them to wreck themselves. That's a scary place for a kid. The first day of school is a scary place for a kid. Riding the bus for the first time is a scary thing for a kid. And a lot of the parents drive their kids to school because, like, I'm not doing that to my kid. They're doing it for, listen, parents, you're doing it for you. Let's be honest. But when those kids get on the bus and they have, I talked to a kid that went to school for the first time on a school bus. I met with him last Sunday. Cool kid. Loved the kid. I said, how was it? Well, it's great. I mean, he felt like he'd conquered Mount Everest. I said, you make some new friends? Yeah. I said, how was it? Great. And we get two recesses. I said, there it is. I said, how's, what's your favorite class? Jim? Like, oh boy. Listen, but what would have happened if they had just kind of sheltered him? Listen, God doesn't send some of these bad things that happen to us. And listen, but he doesn't take us out of them all the time either. And sometimes that's because he's trying to work something into us as he's working something out of us. I know during the darkest time of my life, and it was dark, I mean real dark, where I'd go at night every night and pray, God, just take me home. Let me die of a heart attack. Just take me home. I don't want to do this anymore. He didn't do that. He was like my dad. Son, we're going to face this. I love you. We're going to do this what? Together. And he's trying to work some sinfulness out of my life and work some fruit into it. Let me read you from Galatians. These are some of the things God works out. But if you are guided and led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the practices of the sinful nature, and we all have this. Amen or oh me? We all have a sinful nature. They're clearly ever evident Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, totally irresponsible, lacking self-control, idolatry, sorcery, hostility. Don't see any of that today, do we? Strife, jealousy, fits of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, riotous behavior. I know somebody was saying, I know where those people live. And other things like this. Now listen, we all struggle with those things. No temptation has taken us that's not common to man, is what the Bible says. He said, I warned you beforehand, just as I did previously, that those that practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But the fruit, I want you to remember this. It doesn't say the fruits, plural. This is one thing that the Spirit brings in our life. But the fruit of the Spirit, the result of His presence within us when we give our life to Christ, is love an unselfish concern for others. Joy, inner peace, patience, not the ability to wait, but how we act while we're waiting. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. And what God's doing is he's working that sinfulness out and working his spirit more and more into us. I know my granddaughter's not saved yet. You know how I know that? She hates patience. She hates it. She hates to wait. No self-control, all those things. Now listen, there's going to come a day when God is going to draw her, if you will. He's already working on it, but he's going to draw her and she's going to give her life and he's going to put his spirit into her, God willing, and she's going to be changed. And when he changes her, he's going to make and continue to do this work. We can become more and more like Christ each and every what? Day. When I got saved, I was a horrible person. Talked to my mom after church. I lived that first list pretty well, except for sorcery. I never did any sorcery, I don't think. But the rest I did pretty well. Um, 
And when I gave my life to Christ, he began to work some of these things in so that when people hang around me now, they don't recognize me. When I went on vacation, one of the people I went on vacation with was a person from high school. And they even said this. They said, you're different. So is that good or bad? I don't know. And we, we got along great, but I just wasn't the same what? Person. I hope it wasn't because I was boring. I don't know, but... The last thing I want you to remember is this. Remember what God has done for you. So be honest with him about your struggle. Realize he's working something out of you, but he's also working something into you. And remember what God has done. That last verse, who has a different translation than mine? That last verse, can somebody say it out loud for me? Don't be scared. Or I'll read it. I'll grab the Bible and read it for you. You may have a different translation. What does yours say? And your what? Acquaintance. My acquaintance is darkness. Some translation has my friend is darkness. In the Hebrew, it ends with the word darkness. That's why they translate it that way. And when I first read that, I thought, you know, he's complaining. But I think God's got a deeper meaning there. This is all Larry, by the way, this morning, just for a second. And what I mean by that is, I didn't get this from a commentary. This, this kind of came to me as I was praying and studying about this. We always think of God in the light. Amen? You know, God is light. God is love. Do we ever think God is darkness? No, but your Bible says it. What? Let me read it to you. Write these verses down. You can study it later. The translation that I really like was one that said, my familiar friend is in darkness. In 1 Kings 8, 12, it says, the Lord has said he would dwell in thick darkness. When Moses goes up on the mountain to talk to God face to face, it says this, and Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God dwells. Psalm 97, 2. The clouds and thick darkness are all around him talking about God. We always expect God to show up in mighty mouse fashion. I'm being serious. Y'all never will forget this. Hopefully for good, not bad. What did mighty mouse always say? Here I come to save the day. That's how I love Mighty Mouse. <laughs> and he would come and save. But the Bible's very clear. There are times that God lets darkness fall. Matter of fact, a lot of the great saints call it the dark night of the soul. And what it would do is it would sift out things that were in your life. Most of us, if we can be honest with ourselves, we serve God. And we fall in love with God because we came to understand the gospel and what he did for us through Jesus Christ. But then we, we have this reciprocation belief that if I serve him, then he'll serve me. And if I do right by him, he'll bless me. But when something bad comes, God gives a promise. Do you all remember the promise? Uh, whatever happens, what? what I will work, what? All things together. For good, And so when a bad comes or darkness comes or a trial comes, we really need to remember this, church. We need to be honest with God. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed things like this. God, why are you letting this happen? Have we not served you? We sound like Psalm 88. Am I not giving my life to you? Is this, is this what it's going to be like? I mean, first cancer and then the back and then the gallbladder and now this. I mean, when does it stop? Where are you? Fix it. In silence. How many of y'all ever felt like that? I'm the only one? There you go. Why didn't he fix it? And so you, you're honest with him and you, you pour your heart out to him. Does God not know what you're feeling and what you're going through? Do you think you're fooling him? Listen, if I feel all that and I'm praying this, Lord, you say whatever, whatever happens, I'm to praise you, so I'm praising you right now for all that. Listen, sometimes that doesn't happen. 
Sometimes the struggle's real. And God wants us to be honest. King David did it. Jeremiah the prophet did it. A lot of the judges did it. A lot of people spoke because they had a relationship with God. You ever spoke to your spouse that, that, that way? You shouldn't. Have you ever done it? Dean, you ever looked at somebody? What are you doing? It's relationship. And then you need to remember this. Don't ever lose this. God is working something out and trying to work something in. And so in my life, what I've been learning is God's showing me a lot of things that are really broken about me. Things I thought, things I held on to that I need to let go of. Things that, that I thought were majorly important and they're really not. And what I didn't think was important is very important. And then I need to remember that oftentimes God is the one in the darkness. You remember when Christ died for you? Something fell on Christ. I think it was for three hours. Do you all remember what it was? Darkness. And it got quiet during that time. What I had always heard preached was, well, that's when Satan... And all the demons came and tried to launch their last attack on Christ, and that's why the darkness came. We don't know that. Well, that's when God put the sin on him and all the darkness of sin. We don't know that either. It may have been because God himself had drawn near to the what? Son. And then when that lifted, that is when Christ yells out, what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me. It's Psalm 22. The rest of it goes, why are you so far from my groanings? He talks about laying his head on his pillow and crying at night, not hearing my prayers. God is closer than you think. We always expect God to come in like mighty mouse. And sometimes he doesn't because he's trying to do something great in your life. Now, Larry, how do you end that on a happy note? You can't but I'll show you how God works in it. I'll show you with Rick Warren and Toby Mack. Toby Mack really worked hard from that. If you want to hear a good song on the way home, he wrote a song for his son called 21 Years, and that's how he did it. But his wife, remember she got angry at God? And she got angry at the situation, and then it turned. He worked, God worked that out of her and worked something into her. And this is what he began to work in her life. She began to pray to God after going through all that struggle. She started said, God, will you use this to bring a million people to you? Show us how to use this to bring people to you. And she got a new purpose. When Rick Warren um, lost his son, he got thousands and thousands and thousands of letters. And he said, I've got them. I got them from presidents and ambassadors and governor, people he had met. He said, but those weren't the ones that encouraged him. And he even talked about some of them were filled with Christian cliches. You'll see him again. It's okay. We know he's in Christ. You'll see him again. He said the letters that encouraged him were the people his son had brought to Christ. His son would go in these chat rooms with people that struggled the way he did, and he led a bunch of them to Christ. And he said, then I realized, you know, God not only used him, he can use this too. And God worked it out and worked something in. And in the darkness, God shows up in a powerful way. And Rick Warren and his wife had a new ministry that I never planned on, was dealing with parents, with children, with the same problems his son had. He said, I never wanted to do that, but I'm doing that. And he's blessed them. God, don't let God, don't let God doesn't waste anything. Don't waste your pain. I've been able to talk to men. I can't tell you how many men I've been talking to going through the same thing I've been going through. We're encouraging one another, helping one another. Some of y'all have come to me in some horrific stuff. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about, some horrific stuff. And we can dwell in the past on that, or we can be honest with God, say, I'm angry, I'm hurt. I don't know what you're trying to work into me, but I pray that you work it into me and help me to let go of the things I need to. And then realize God is in this darkness and he'll use it and he'll use you to help somebody going through their darkness. 
comforting them with the comfort you receive from God. Does that make sense, church? This message is just for those that are really in a dark spot, but I hope we all get something from it today. God has not left you. He's closer than you realize. You just can't see him. But he's there. Just like my dad. You got this. Come on, son, you can do this. He's going to work you through. Amen? Let's pray. Father, as we leave here today, I pray that no matter where we are and what we're facing, you will never leave us or forsake us. If we're your children, you will work all things together for good for those who, who love you and are called according to your purpose. Even when we're faithless, your word says you were faithful. And God, thank you for never letting us go. Thank you for loving us and blessing us despite ourselves. And Father, I pray that in the light of the cross that you loved us so much that you gave your son for us to die in our place, not to condemn us, but to save us, that in light of that, we will realize in this dark place we're in, Christ already experienced the true darkness of being separated so that we would never be separated from you. Just help us to trust what we can't see. Help us to trust you're right there with us and you're not going to let us go. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.